Okay, so let's get into this. Last time, uh, or we, we worked through these long-term growth things, and one of the assumptions we made was that we were at full capacity. But it's often the case that factories are not at full capacity, or whatever the, the machine is. By the way, does it have to be a factory? No, it could be a server. Have you guys tried to go out and use ChatGPT yet? What do you get most of the time when you go out and try to use it? Yeah, it says, uh, sorry, pal. A lot of people are trying to use me, so you're just out of luck. So that thing is fully utilized right now. Um, that's not usually the case, but they could go out and push purchase additional capacity, right? They have, they have already like a LED one. They call it twenty dollars a month. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So now they're. I like it. They're making money, right? Yeah. Um, so they're you charging you to give you wrong answers. I like that. Okay. <laughs> Now, back to the story. Um, and the same thing we see with uh, factories. Factories could be at full capacity, uh, and you can build additional capacity. And so far, what we have assumed is that the factory is full, and that we need to purchase additional capacity in order to be able to, be, to meet these new sales. But what if you're not there? So we're going to relax that assumption, and we're going to be told that we're running at 90% of full capacity. And so we can think of our current sales being um, the fraction of the full capacity used times the full capacity. So we know our current um, sales. We also know what fraction of full capacity we're using. We're told that, right? And using that information, doing a little algebraic magic here, rearranging, we can see that our full capacity is going to be equal to our current sales divided by the fraction of full capacity that's currently used. And so we know right now we're selling a thousand, and we're going to divide that by 0.90 and see that our full capacity is 1,111.11111. Um, and what that means is we could actually increase our production by 11.11% uh, without adding any capacity, new capacity at all. Does that make sense? Because we're currently at 1,000, we could go all the way up to 1,011.11111. And uh, we're, we're trying to go to 1,200, so we're already part of the way there. Now, I'm going to tell you that when this is said and done, the way we're doing this, we will end up at full capacity when we are done. And then I'm going to give you some arguments as to why this isn't necessarily a good idea to take things up to full capacity. So, how do we know now how much additional capacity we need? Well, we can take our uh, required uh, sales, or our 20% growth of 1,200. We're going to subtract that full capacity and then divide the full capacity. And s divide by full capacity. And what that's going to do is tell us, oh, by the way, there's a typo here. Uh, if I had not subtracted the 111.11, .11, it would have been 1.08. Since I did subtract it, it's just 0.08. Basically, what we're saying is that we need to increase our assets by 8% in order to be able to meet the new requirement and be at full capacity. OK, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take that assets of 500. We're going to take it up to 540. What were we taking it up to previously? 500 times 1.2. Mr. Poloski, how, how big were we making the assets in the first four examples? 500. That was how much we started with. We're going to grow 20%. 600. Yeah, we had to go to 600. But now we see if we, if we only have 90% capacity utilization, we only have to grow from 500 to 540. That means that there's a lot less money that has to be raised. Now, going back through, you could work all those examples one more time, and instead of taking it up to 600 in assets, you would only take it up to 540. And the first one where we required a constant debt to equity ratio, we would have had 270 and 270 because you add those together and get 540. In other words, after we make this adjustment, everything else is exactly the same. Does that make sense? Okay, now I'm going to tell you why I think 
going to uh, full capacity is a bad idea. First of all, do you think people make mistakes? Oh yeah. So used to, when I was in charge of a machine shop, um, we would be getting really close to being able to ship our product, which was a valve, and one of my guys would screw something up. And what that means is that particular part would have to be remade. Now, if I were operating at 100% capacity, would I be able to remake that part and still get that valve out on time? No. I would have my choice between remaking and get the, getting that valve out on time, but it would put every other customer order out. Does that make sense? It would put everything else out, and I'd be missing my promises to my customers basically till the end of time. And so what I'm going to tell you, oh, let's go through the other two reasons. Uh, number uh, two is recovering from breakdowns. Do you think machines work 100% of the time, all the time? No. I mean, Amazon Web Services has a really good uptime, but how many times have you gone out and found that your favorite website was down because Amazon Web Services, and, and more than one of your favorite websites were down because they're all hosted on Amazon? Machines break down. And when machines break down, as soon as the machine is back up, guess what? you got to try to catch up. And if you're running at 100%, you'll never catch up. And then we have taking on surprise orders. This is my favorite. So I'm going to tell you about my business here. I would receive orders in. By the way, I was making subsurface safety valves. And so those are valves that go down into the oil well. And if those are down there and functioning, if something happens on the offshore oil rig and it gets like a, a ship hits the oil rig or something, then basically that well slams, the valve slams shut and all the fish are happy because no oil gets out. It's a happy, happy thing. Now, uh, usually people are pretty good about planning when they'll need the valve. And so they order it well in advance. And when they ordered well in advance, uh, I would give them a, lit, a lead time of six to 12 weeks and a price of around $100,000, which was really reasonable at the time. Now, if someone failed to plan and they were getting really close to needing my valve and they re remembered that they hadn't ordered it, then they would call me in a panic. And here's why they were panicked. Not only was the well going to be late, basically turning on to get oil out of the thing, so they're going to postpone their earnings from it, but the other thing is that at the time, and I'm sure it's way more than this now, at the time, this is 1997, uh, rig rental was $250,000 a day. So this is just to rent the rig that's sitting out there in the ocean. And then we've got all our people that are stuck out there. We have to feed them. We have to pay them. We have to haul away their waste. I mean, there's all sorts of expenses involved every day in having this drilling rig out there. And so basically, if I could save them one day on their schedule, it saved them over $250,000. And more than likely, I was going to save them way more than one day by expediting their order. So I would charge them 300000 for the same valve, and they would be happy to pay it. Does that make sense? Now, if I had been running at 100% capacity in my operation, could I have thrown that hot order into the pipeline? No, there's no way. No way I could have done it without making every other order late. And so this, these are three good reasons not to go to full capacity. Now, previously, what we've assumed is that we were at full capacity and that afterwards we were also at full capacity. Then I told you about going from a part of full capacity up to full capacity. That was the last slide. But here's what I'm going to tell you here is it doesn't matter what percentage of full capacity we're at. If we use the method like we did originally with the assumption of full capacity, you wind up with exactly the same percentage utilized at the end as you did at the beginning. And so I always tried to run my operation at about 80%. 
try to run about 80% to make up for these three reasons. And so if I used the uh, technique that I showed you in examples one through four, I would be still 80% utilized after increasing the capacity that we have for our assets. Does that make sense? And so I wouldn't worry about the slide above this one in my case because I was exactly where I wanted to be capacity-wise, and so I didn't bother to do this thing at all. Any questions? Okay. Now, here's your problem method summary. First of all, where do we start out with? It's always the sales growth forecast. It's always the sales growth forecast, and that makes a great multiple choice question. Number two, you got to note your capacity utilization and your constraints. Constraints could be your dividend payout policy, could be your capital structure. Those are going to be the things that tell us uh, how much we're going to have to raise internally, externally, debt versus equity. We're going to determine how much new equity is coming from the addition to retained earnings, and we've got to use our net income and our dividend payout constraints. For example, now let's just ask really quickly to make sure you still remember. Net income flows to two places. What are those? Retained earnings and dividends. Very good. And so that dividend constraint that we throw on that is going to impact how much addition to retained earnings that we have. And then we're going to find our percentage increase in assets needed to support the new sales level. We've got to think about the capacity utilization if we're trying to go from sub full capacity up to full capacity. Otherwise, if you're just trying to end up at the same sub full capacity, don't worry about it. We're going to find our external financing needed by subtracting the old debt, the old equity, and the new addition retained earnings from the new asset level. Now, that doesn't tell us whether we have to do that in debt or equity, but it does tell us how much we're going to have to raise outside. The last step here is to use the capital structure constraints to figure out how much of that external financing is going to have to be in debt and how much is going to be in equity. What if I figure out that I need to pay down my debt and that's the only external thing I'm doing? What will my external financing look like? What will be the sign on it? Negative. Yeah, it's going to be negative. It's going to be negative. So don't freak out if you see an external financing needed that's negative. It just means that you've got more money than you need. Okay, now let's talk about two growth rates using our retained earnings, and they are the internal growth rate and the sustainable growth rate. So the internal growth rate is the rate at which we can grow the assets of the firm based on internal equity alone. It's the rate we can grow the firm based on internal equity alone. Now what does that mean? It means we're going out, we're selling stuff, we've got net income, we're not paying out all of that net income as dividends, so some of it becomes addition to retained earnings. And that amount of money under the internal growth rate, that amount of money is what we have to spend on new assets. And if that means we can grow our assets by 4%, then we can grow our sales by 4%. So that's the internal growth rate. Now, what's the sustainable growth rate? Well, it's growing the assets of the firm, and therefore the sales, at a rate that utilizes all of that same addition to retained earnings. In other words, only internal equity and just enough debt to maintain a constant debt to equity ratio. And just enough debt to maintain a constant debt to equity ratio. So what does that mean? Let's assume that our debt to equity ratio is one. That means for every dollar of debt, or every dollar of equity, we've got one dollar of debt. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now let's think about if we have a firm and they're trying to decide between IGR and SGR and they have one dollar of addition to retained earnings. If they are thinking in terms of the internal growth rate, how many new dollars of assets can they buy? Just one, right? But what if they instead use the sustainable growth rate and they say we can use 
our addition retained earnings plus enough debt to maintain that constant debt to equity ratio. How many dollars of new assets can they buy with one dollar of addition retained earnings? Two, because they've got that one dollar worth of equity and then the dollar of debt they go out there and raise to keep that debt to equity ratio at one. Does that make sense? And so what this means is, as long as there's any debt whatsoever in the capital structure, the sustainable growth rate will be greater than the internal growth rate. As long as there's any debt whatsoever in the capital structure, the sustainable growth rate will be greater than the internal growth rate. What if there's no debt in this capital structure at all? What will be the relationship between IGR and SGR? Yeah, they're going to be exactly the same. They're going to be exactly the same. Okay, so now we need to get on to the formula. And the formula for the internal growth rate looks like this. Uh, you guys are familiar with ROA. What does ROA stand for? Very good, return on assets. And then there's this thing we haven't talked about yet, and it is lowercase b. And lowercase b has two names. It's either the plowback ratio or the retention ratio. The plowback ratio or the retention ratio. Let me explain, for those of you who didn't grow up on the farm, about why we're talking about plowing back. Uh, when you go out and you harvest grain, do you want the whole plant? No, you're only really interested in the part that has the seeds. And so you end up with a lot of other stuff that's left over. Now, the cool thing is if you plow that stuff back into the ground, it helps you to grow the next crop because that stuff decomposes and puts stuff back into the ground. And so that's how the name plowback ratio comes about. We are, we're not taking all the money and paying it out as dividends. We're taking some of that money and plowing it back into the farm to facilitate future growth. And by the way, if you don't have any growth opportunities at all, it doesn't make any sense for you to be retaining earnings at all. You don't need new assets if you're not growing, and therefore you should be paying out all of your net income as dividends. Okay, so what we have here is ROA times B divided by one minus do you recognize the same thing down there? If I were you, I'd be calculating that thing and storing it in my calculator, and that, this will make this a lot easier. Now, what is the plowback ratio? It is just the percentage of the firm's earnings that we are retaining. And so it's the addition to retained earnings divided by the net income. It's the addition to retained earnings divided by the net income. And I can tell you one more thing. The dividend payout ratio is the uh, amount of dividends divided by the net income. And we know that addition to retained earnings plus dividends is equal to net income. And so we could also say that this thing is one minus the dividend payout ratio. Be very careful. Here's very, you write, write this down on your note sheet. Be very careful to make sure that I've given you the plowback ratio. Because sometimes in a question, instead, I will give you the dividend payout ratio. If you get lucky, that dividend payout ratio will be 0.5. And it'll end up exactly the same either way. Do you think I'm really crazy enough to do that? No. It's going to be like 0.3, right? And then. To get your plowback ratio, you'll have to take one minus that dividend payout ratio to get your plowback ratio. And that plowback ratio is what goes into this formula. So be very careful. By the way, the, I'll, I'll get you in a second. the secret to doing well on a finance exam, lots of people think that it's math. In truth, it's reading. Read first. Read carefully. And if I were you, what I would do is start down at the question, the actual question that it asks, and you've got in your mind, what kinds of things do I need to solve for that? You go back and read. 
and read to make sure that I've given you, say, the payout ratio instead of, uh, or that I've given you the plotback ratio instead of the dividend and payout ratio. Do you have a question? Uh, no, no, I figured it out. Oh, very good. Uh, so basically, if you give us the flyback ratio, then we just gotta do the addition 13 and multiply by net income. Okay, so if I give you the flyback ratio, all you've got to do is plug it in for me. Okay, but if we get, if you give us the it dividend payout ratio, ratio, we have to take it minus one. Yeah, one minus. One minus, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay. yeah. Those things will always add to one. Okay. Good question. That, that's, that's so close, though. Like, um, so I back and pay out. Uh -huh. It will kind of like make it like confusing, I guess. Oh my goodness. Have you not already figured out that finance is confusing? <laughs> I mean, we didn't do it on purpose. Don't get me wrong. Because honestly, I, I thought that fly back and pay out was the same thing. Oh, no, no, no. And that's why I fell short, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Oh, very good. Yeah. Okay, the other name for plot back ratio is. The, what's the other name? Retention, Retention. Retention. Retention ratio. Now, why do we say that? Because it's the part that we're retaining. It's the part of the net income that we're retaining. Now, which one will I use on the exam? Who knows? Both. Right. <laughs> Both, maybe. Who knows, right? I could get crazy. I, I will not call it the Zanzibar ratio or something that you haven't heard of before, though. I, I, I make sure not to do that sort of thing. That would be cool. Okay, now, any questions before we move on to how we're going to calculate the sustainable growth rate? Okay, I'm going to show you this and I'm going to ask you a quick question. What is the only difference in that formula? ROE. Yeah, it's ROE versus ROA. Otherwise, the formulas are exactly the same. And here's what we know. We know that ROA is equal to ROE is equal to ROA times the equity multiplier, which is just one plus the debt to equity ratio. So we know that as debt goes up, ROE is going to climb away from ROA. What do you think that means for sustainable growth rate uh, as we add in debt? How's it going to move versus the internal growth rate? Yeah, it's going to get further and further away, right? So we know that the sustainable growth rate, the more debt we have in the capital structure, the faster this thing's going to grow. And that makes all the sense in the world because we know that uh, if, let's say that we've got a debt to equity ratio of three, that means for every dollar of addition to retained earnings, how many dollars of debt can we go out and raise? Three. Three. And so we can buy four new dollars of assets instead of one with the internal growth rate. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's talk about what impacts IGR and SGR. Both of them, yes? Sorry, I have a question. Go ahead. Why is this called the sustainable growth rate? If we're ah. Okay, so um, in finance, we assume that you want, that every industry has an optimal capital structure. If I grow on internal growth rate alone, what will happen is over time, I will get more and more equity in my capital structure, and I will move away from that opt optimal capital structure. However, if I grow at the sustainable growth rate, then I will be staying at that optimal capital structure. But is it possible we could grow faster than the sustainable growth rate and maintain the same capital structure? It's hard. Yeah, how would we do it? So, exactly, I don't know, but oh, okay. it's hard to maintain that. It really is. If we go faster then. Yeah, so it, it really is, and you have to make adjustments. And if you, yeah. if you were unfortunate to have taken my 480 class, you would have seen me draw pictures about that. But here's what I'll tell you. You can grow faster than the sustainable growth rate and maintain the same debt to equity ratio if you issue outside equity. If you issue outside equity, then you can grow faster than the sustainable growth rate and maintain the same debt to equity ratio. And let's talk about in the real world, what does that mean for a company? If I'm a small company in the beginning, maybe I can only grow at the internal growth rate because no bank is gonna loan me money, right? But then, as time goes on, maybe the banks will start to lend me money, and then I can get up to my target capital structure. 
And then for a while, as long as things aren't growing too crazy, I can grow at the sustainable growth rate and not have to uh, sell any external equity, which means I don't have to share. By the way, do people like to share? No, we would all enjoy not sharing if we could get by with it. Does that make sense? I mean, that's just humans, don't feel bad about that. That's why we have to teach children to share, right? It's not natural. Okay, now eventually though, let's say that the opportunity is just so darn big that you need to grow really fast in order to be able to capture that opportunity. At that point, you have to go out and issue external equity. And we said at that point, that's when the firm is going to go from being an LLC to being a corporation, and that's the point at which they're going to do an IPO. And that's going to be that external equity coming to, into the firm. Now later on, assume that they are, things are still going crazy, they've already IPO'd, they can do what's called an SEO, a secondary equity offering or a seasoned equity offering, to go out and raise more external equity. But there are two problems with going out and issuing external equity. Number one, now I have to split the profit of the firm with more people. And number two, I have to split control of the firm with more people. And so if we can get by without issuing that external equity, we would love to be able to do so. Long explanation, but does that help you? Yes. Yes. Very good. I could tell he's a little bit, I think he's not thinking as clearly because he's missing his mustache. By the way, for those of you who weren't here, that was an accident. It'll be back. Don't worry. Okay. Now, uh, so what's going to impact both IGAR and SGR? Well, how about the profit margin, right? If I make a higher profit margin on the same amount of sales, then I've got more net income to do something with. It means I'm going to be retaining or plowing back a greater amount because I'll be, even if I do the same proportion plowback ratio, uh, I'll have more net income to take that proportion of. And so it'll be able to, we'll be able to grow faster the higher our profit margin is. And then we've got our total asset turnover. If you remember, ROA is profit margin times total asset turnover. And so the higher our total asset turnover is, the more we're going to be able to do. And let's talk about why that is. This is sales over total assets. If this is low, then I have to grow assets quite a bit to get a decent increase in sales. But what if this is quite high? Then I can grow my assets just a little bit and get a big increase in sales. And so we see that profit margin and total asset turnover is going to help both of these because, of course, they, uh, you can see this is ROA, and ROA is actually in both of these because we're just going to multiply by equity multiplier to get ROE. Now, dividend policy is going to impact both. Which variable up there is impacted by dividend policy? Say again? R-O-E. Now, it's the B, right? Remember, 1 minus the dividend payout ratio is, that's, that's B, right? And so the uh, lower your dividend payout ratio is, the higher your retention ratio is, the faster you can grow. And that's going to impact both of these. And then finally, your financial policy, meaning your capital structure. It's only going to affect your SGR because it shows up right here in the equity multiplier, there's your capital structure, and so it's only going to impact your sustainable growth rate. Questions? Okay. Mm. So what do we conclude here? Number one, this is some difficult stuff. Nobody gets it the first time they see it. So go back, watch the video. Um, work any kind of practice I've thrown out there, but I will tell you this. How much of this kind of stuff do you think I'm going to be putting on the exam? Ooh. Well, let's think about the breakdown of the exam. I said we've got chapters one through four. Twenty of them are going to be yeah, calculation. 
And so that means of chapters two, three, and four, the only ones that have math in them, we're gonna have seven, seven, and six, right? And so you think about all the stuff we talked about in chapter three, and then you think about this stuff. What I'm telling you is even if you don't manage to grasp this material, it's not gonna blow you out of the water. This might be the difference between an A student and a B student. Does that make sense? Okay. Whew. Now we're done with that. Now let's go ahead and talk about I'm going to pull up some time value money stuff here. questions to, I'm going to prove to you that you don't know what you're talking about with time value of money. When we say present value and future value, does the future value necessarily have to be in the future? No. Does the present value necessarily have to be right now? No. The only thing these things mean is the present value comes before the future value. That's all that means, so don't let that freak you out. Now, um, Let's talk about formulas. When we look at time value of money formulas, I would tell you that there's really only one formula out of all this stuff that you need to have on your sheet. And uh, it's not, it's a, uh, well, it's not even in this one. So there we go. So we'll wait a little bit on that. I would tell you that it is the formula for the present value of a growing perpetuity. A formula for the present value of a growing perpetuity. So let's talk a little bit about what a perpetuity is. Ms. Black, what is a perpetuity? Say it. Oh, okay, so you're thinking about annuity due versus ordinary annuity. So, anybody, you, what's a perpetuity? It's a cash flow that continues forever. Yeah, it's a set of cash flows that goes on forever. And the way to remember that is perpetual means goes on forever. A perpetuity goes on forever. A growing perpetuity goes on forever and grows at a constant rate. So the present value of that growing perpetuity <laughs> is equal to the first cash flow divided by R minus G. What do you think R is? Rate. Yeah, the rate of return, the required rate of return. What's G? The growth, the growth rate. Now, why am I telling you that's the only formula that you need to have on your note sheet? Uh, number one, your calculator can do everything else. Number two, um, let's assume that it's a regular perpetuity and not a growing perpetuity. What can you do? What's the growth rate on a regular perpetuity? Zero. Zero. There you go. Does that make sense? And so if I were you, as far as prison value goes, the only prison value formula I would have on my note sheet is that. Assuming you know how to use the TIBA2 plus calculator to do your other calculations. Okay. Now, let's talk about... Um, an annuity. I'm gonna I'm gonna come back to Ms. Black because she's she she was so close to answering when when Mr. Okay. So uh, what is an annuity? Yeah, and what what does each cash flow have in common with the others? Yeah, they're all the same amount. Okay. Now, without looking at your notes, can you explain to me the difference between an ordinary annuity? And an annuity due. Um, ordinary annuities in the beginning. <laughs> so close. <laughs> you knew the difference. You knew that it was in versus beginning. Okay. Ordinary. So by the way, in a finance, we assume cash flows happen at the end of the period unless we are told otherwise. Right? So an ordinary annuity happens at the end. 
and annuity do happens at the beginning. Now, between the two of those, other, everything otherwise identical, between the two of those, which is going to have a higher present value? Um, yeah, at the beginning, annuity do, right? Because you get the money sooner, right? We, we always want the money sooner. Can your calculator do annuities? Yeah, what button are you going to use for that cash flow that happens the set number of times? Is it the CF? Oh, Sorry. swing and a miss. How about PMT? Uh. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm already proving to you that you don't know, right? So when we have an annuity, we're going to have something for the number of periods. And we're going to have something for I per Y, which is the required return. By the way, N is the number of periods. Uh, in the formulas, it would be represented by the letter T, right? I per Y is actually R. And we've got to make sure something between I per Y and N. We've got to make sure they are the same time scale. If your interest rate is per year, then your uh, number of periods needs to be years. If your interest rate is per month, then the number of periods needs to be months, right? What if you've got monthly payments over five years? Yeah, you've got to multiply five by how much? Twelve, right? And now we're up to n is equal to 60. Now, something that we've got up there on the screen is, is compounding. Um, so, do you know the difference between an APR and the effective rate? Can someone tell me what the APR is? By the way. I just know that the effective rate is, is equal to the norm. Oh, very good. Um, no. <laughs> okay, so. The APR is equal to the nominal, mm -hmm. and effective EFF is equal to the uh, effective annual rate. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, so EAR. EAR, very good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's think about um, an APR of 12% for monthly payments. What is the monthly percentage? That's just 1%, right? The definition of APR, which is also the same as stated or nominal or quoted interest rate, these are all the same thing. Remember I told you it would get more confusing? Yeah. Um, those are all the same thing. And if, I, if you're not told otherwise, well, no, I won't say that. OK, so stated, nominal, APR, quoted, all the same thing. And it's all the sub-period rate multiplied by the number of sub-periods per year. It's all the sub-period rate multiplied by the number of sub-periods per year. If we're talking months, that's 12 sub-periods per year. If we're talking weeks, how many sub-periods per year? 52. 52. I am so pleased. Most of the time students say 54. And I say, are you high? Right. OK, so 52. Now, what if I had something where the subperiod was two weeks? How many subperiods would there be? 26. Say again? 26. Yeah, 26. And in fact, this is, a, a, I've already gotten this question twice, and it's about the payday loan question. Have you guys seen the payday loan question? So basically, they're saying, I'll give you $500 today in exchange for $575 at the end of two weeks. And the question, we can ask two questions from this. One is, what is the APR? And the second is, what is the EAR? If you want to know the APR, all you have to do is figure out the subperiod rate here and then multiply it by the number of subperiods per year. How are we going to figure out the subperiod rate? 575 minus 500 divided by 500 is equal to 0.15. That's equal to 15%. Are you with me so far? Okay. Now, 
If I were going to figure out the APR, all I'm going to do is take that subperiod rate and multiply by the number of subperiods per year. The subperiod is two weeks long. How many of the subperiods are there per year? 26, right? Okay, so 260% plus 130%, um, 390%, is that right? Someone put it through their calculator, is that right? Are you guys amazed that I can do that? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. 3.9%. I get 3.9. Oh, what well you did, you didn't multiply your, right? You just took this. I mean, I tried to buy 130 by 390. Yeah, that's the difference. You gotta remember which one you're working in, right? And by the way, would 3.9% be one of the likely answers on the exam? Yeah, be careful. I'm glad you said that, because that trips up a lot of people. Okay, now, back to the question. Are you amazed that I can do that in my head? No. No? Because I'm old, right? So when I was a kid, we weren't allowed to use calculators in school. You know, that gave us tremendous ability to do math in our head. Now, think about this. You guys are probably going to try to write your next paper using chat GPT. What does that do to your ability to write and think critically in verbal terms? Where's the human race going to? We won't be able to read, we won't be able to do math. And then where will we be? But I digress. Okay, now, that's the APR. Yeah. So we, we found the APR, which is the 15% correct. Oh, the 90%. Yeah, 90%. Okay, so the 50% is the sub period. No, yeah. it, it the is. The sub period return was because it was over that two week period, right? Okay, so when putting it into my calculator, wouldn't I put it in as a percentage? The 15? Okay, where, where we're going, yes. But I got 3.9. Do I have to times it? You, yeah, right now, well, the way we figured this, you have to uh, do that yourself. The multiplication, the multiplication of 100. Now okay. there is a way you could do this on your time value of money keys on your calculator. You could have a negative 500 as your present value. You could have positive 575 as your future value. You could have one for n because it's one sub period. Okay. And you could compute i for y. Now one thing that we should have mentioned before we got started here is that you always want to hit second FV. Second FV before we start any time value of any calculation on the calculator because the calculator will remember what you had in there previously. If you don't clear it up, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So always do second clear TBM before any of these. So then once you've got it clear, positive 575, negative 500 for PV, and one compute I for Y. What do you get? 14.22. 14 14.22? 14 yep. Are you sure? Positive. Positive. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's see. First of all, I'm going to do my math to make sure that my brain has it. So, okay, we're going to go through and we're going to see exactly what you've got in here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Second, third TBM, 1, and uh, 500, TB, 575, negative future value. It doesn't matter which I get positive or negative. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a defective calculator. So everybody else is getting 15 when they do this, right? Is anybody not getting 15? You got 14 going to do? Oh! I know what. What's that? Yeah, so, so uh, let's see. Compute. I for what? Yours is 15. Okay, we're going to have to do the calculator purification ritual here. Are you ready? In fact, you all can play along at home if you want. Are you ready? Yeah. Second. Plus minus. I was going to say reset with a question mark. Let's hit enter. Now it says reset 0.00. .00. The second thing I want to do, second decimal point, 9, 
enter. That last part was second decimal point tonight, enter. And now we're going to say 575, future value, 500, negative, present value, at end of one, compute, for one. There we go. I don't know what virus you had. I just want to say that. Oh, <laughs> did you hear that? They're blaming the fact that I've been working every day, practicing this stuff. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Okay, if your calculator starts throwing weird answers during an exam, do the do the exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I sound all trouble. Okay, now now that we know the A P R, we can calculate the effective annual rate. Now the difference between these is the effective annual rate takes compounding into account and the AEPR does not. This thing really likes you guys. Okay. So if we're compounding more than once per year, this effective annual rate is going to be greater than the APR. That's the first thing I can tell you with certainty. If we're compounding more than once a year, this thing's going to be greater because you've got extra money you're earning in the meantime, interest on interest. By the way, that's another multiple choice question people miss. Compounding is, and there's all sorts of crazy other choices, the correct answer is the earning of interest on interest. Compounding is the earning of interest on interest, and I don't know why people keep missing that. Okay, now we can go for the EAR. And as Ms. Roll has pointed out, your calculator knows how to do this. Here's how. Hit your second button, and then hit the number two. Hit the second button, and then hit the number two. Oh, wake up. There we go. What happens when you hit second two? What does it say? Nom. And remember, we said that nominal, APR, stated, and quoted all mean exactly the same thing. So what are we going to put in for nominal? Yeah, 390. And just to remind you, it's 15% times 26. Now, an uh, arrow up. You guys know where the arrow is. the first, then Oh, you got to hit enter first. She is absolutely right. Oh, my goodness. She is absolutely right. OK, now, arrow up. C per Y is compoundings per year. How many times per year does this thing get compounded? 26. 26. Ms. Roll, what do we have to do after we type 26? Um, enter. Enter! <laughs> oh, I can hear she's getting ahead. And then we do one more arrow up. And now, what is the second? EFF. EFF. What do you think EFF stands for? Effective. Something effective. Yeah. <laughs> and so what we're going to do there is hit compute, which is, uh, what's it say on the calculator for compute? CPT. CPT. So hit CPT, and it should give you a mind-blowingly large number. What does it give you? 3,000. 685. So 685. we're 3,000. Let's just stop. We'll, we'll stop right there just for sake of making sure everybody got the same number. Did you guys get the same number? Yeah. Yeah. Now, there is a formula to do this. This is way easier. I'll tell you that straight up. There is a formula to do this. It'll confuse you and you'll mess up. This is way easier to do it this way. So learn this way. Now you say, wait a minute. There's something called continuous compounding. Continuous compounding means that every little split second, it compounds again and again and again, infinite times per period. Now, there's a weird formula for that, too, with a natural log and e to the x and some other crap. Do you need to know that? No. I'll bet you've watched my video. How do we fool this thing into thinking infinity? Put a bunch of nines. Yeah, you put a bunch of nines. Fill out the calculator for as much as it can take. Put the nines. You fill out your calculator for as much nines as it can take. Yeah. And so uh, what we're going to do, and I don't know how many nines I did, but here's what we're going to do. We're just going to keep hitting nine, 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 n
and then we're going to hit enter. And you can do the same thing when you're calculating a perpetuity. You just say n is equal to 9999999, right? It's close enough. And it's because that as uh, if, if you uh, go back and watch my video on this, you'll see that the first doubling of your compounding uh, gives you a pretty good bump. In fact, let's show you that. First one takes you from, uh, if we're 12% uh, compounding once per year, of course the effective rate is 12%. If we compound twice a year, whoo, we jump all the way up to 12.36%. But if we double again to four, it only takes us up to 12.55%. So instead of gaining 0.36%, we only gain 0.19% on the second doubling. On the third doubling, we only gain 0 0.10. And so there's this diminishing returns to the increasing of the number of times per year that you you compound. And so uh, when you get out this far, the difference between this and infinity is so small, your calculator can't even register it. The difference in the effective between this and infinity is so small, your calculator can't even register it. So that's what I would do if I were you. It's certainly going to get you close enough for a multiple choice exam, that's for sure. And we're talking at like several decimal places before you see any difference whatsoever. Probably beyond anything your calculator can, can register. Questions? So, oh, yeah. in other words, continuously just means the, the nines. Yeah. Okay. Continuously, it's, it means an infinite number of compoundings per period. Okay. Yeah. I know this is one of your questions you had um, forever. Forever. That also means that. Oh, so a perpetuity, uh, infinity. So this is saying an infinite number of compoundings per period with a perpetuity. We're putting in all the nines because it's an infinite number of periods. Okay. And so anytime the calculator needs infinity from you and you don't want to put it, you can put a bunch of nines, that as many nines as you can get, and hit enter. Stop that. Questions? So we do that when we see that we're asked for a perpetuity? Yeah, if you're asked for a perpetuity, you could figure it like an annuity. Only instead of putting the fixed number of periods, just put in a bunch of nines. Does that make sense? Fool your calculator. And by the way, it's in my videos. If you want to go watch those, I tell you exactly how to do that. Okay. Now, we're going to get rid of that one. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Um, I got pretty confused with the weeks. Okay. Um, and one of the questions asks something about giving a certain amount per week or something like that. I auto automatically assumed seven instead of 52. Oh, because you're thinking days in a week, right. not weeks in a year. Oh. Yeah. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Very good. Okay, so there are uh, how many days in a year? 65. And how many weeks in a year? 52. And then there are how many days in a week? Seven. How many hours in a day? How many hours in a week? Was it a day? Oh, you guys have how many hours in a week? 160. Oh, in a week. This is 24 times 7. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Hey, you guys are ahead of the game. At least you knew that there were 52 weeks in the year, right? My, some of my students are like, 54? Like, what? Okay, now, we've already talked a little bit about some of these things, cash flow streams. We talked about perpetuities. There's your formula, but you can also fool it in doing that with bunch of nines for n. Um, growing perpetuities, that's the only formula I told you you should have on the sheet. And here's the tricky thing. You could have fooled your calculator into doing it simply by putting all of minus g in as i for y, and then a bunch of nines in for n. But uh, trying to fool the calculator twice in the same problem tends to be too much for students to get. And so uh, the formula works just fine. And we talked about annuities versus annuities due. Now, uneven cash flows. How do we handle uneven cash flows? Um, 
That's where we do the CF. Yeah, that's where we do the CF. That's where we do the CF. If the cash flow is running, then we do it there. Now, something to remember, uh, just like with the time value of money, you want to clear this thing out first. And I'll tell you why. Because the calculator is like a wife. It never forgets. Right? All that dumb crap that I did back in the 90s, my wife still remembers it. Now, easy solution, guys. Don't do dumb stuff, right? And then you're okay. Now, why do I say that? Uh, and I always get a snotty comment on my teaching evaluations about I'm a sexist pig or whatever because my wife, you know, like, whatever. My wife agrees. Okay, back to the story. Um, if you remember that, then you'll always hit CF second clear work. CF second clear work. Do you guys see the uh, down over your clear button, lower left hand corner? What does it say? Clear work. clear work. So you want to have CF second clear work. And that clears it out. And the reason you want to do that is because there may be more stuff out there. Let's say that the last one that you worked had like 17 periods and or 17 different cash flows. You're going to be in a world of hurt because that crap is going to hang out there and it's going to give you trouble. So don't do that. Just clear it out. Just clear it out. Okay. So how would we do this one in the calculator? Well, it looks like we're investing 10000 at time zero. By the way, cash flows in opposite directions have opposite signs. Cash flows in opposite directions have opposite signs. And so I'm going to make an investment here. That's a cash outflow from me. I'm going to call that negative. What will the cash inflows be? Positive. Yeah, they got to be positive, right? And so what we're saying here is we're going to make an investment of 10000 at time zero. And then we will receive 2500 at time one. 2,500 at time two, zero at time three, and 7,500 at time four. Okay, now, how do I use the CF keys to find the present value of this? I'm gonna hit, I've already cleared it out, right? And right now your calculator should say CF zero equals, is that correct? Okay, I want you to type in there 10,000, then hit the plus minus key, and then, Ms. Roll, what do we have? Enter. The enter key, right? You gotta hit enter or it's like it never happened. Okay, now we're gonna arrow down. Now it says C01. Any idea what we should do there? Yeah, 2,500. Go ahead and type it in. 2,500. Enter. Arrow down. Now, what does it say? F01. What the heck is that? It's the number of times in a row that that cash flow, identical cash flow, appears. How many times does that identical cash flow appear? Twice. So I'm going to put a two there. Two. Enter. And then arrow down. Now, we have already taken care of time one and time two. Now we're up to time three. And by the way, how have we taken care of time one and time two? Because we did that F01 equals two. Now your calculator right now says C02. Probably freaking you out because you were expecting a C03. No. The calculator numbers these as in the different identical cash flows, the distinct cash flows. And so uh, that one is covering both of one and two. And so your C02 will actually be number three. Now, number three, would it be okay for me to just skip over that since it's zero? No. Hit enter, arrow down. By the way, it already had it zero in there, right? You hit enter, you arrow down, it says F01. And that's correct, because zero only happens once. We're going to arrow down again. What are we going to put in for C03? Yeah, 7500. You got to hit enter. Now, we could arrow on down and see that F03 is just one. But if you play with the calculator long enough, you know it's going to be there anyway. Unless your calculator's been possessed like your calculator's were, right? Um, but we, we purified them. They're all good. Um, so now what you're going to do is we are going to use the cash flow register and we're going to find the present value of all those cash flows. What button should I hit next? NPV. NPV. NPV is defined as the sum 
of all cash, the sum of the present values of all the cash flows. And that's exactly what we're looking for here. And so we're going to hit NPV, and then uh, it says, uh, what does it say once you hit NPV? It says, it says I, right? Oh, I, yeah. And what are we going to type in? Seven. Yeah, and we're going to type that in as a percentage. Seven, enter. Yeah. Now, arrow NPV. down. NPV. And then you hit NPV. compute. And what present value does it give you? Yeah, 241.76. Now, students will say, oh, I hate the fact that the cash flow numbers don't match up with the times. Couldn't I just type in 2,500 twice? Yeah, you could. But what if I give you 17 2,500s and then a zero? and then 7,500. Do you really want to sit there and go through 17? No. Learn to do it this way, you'll be a lot faster. By the way, do you think speed's going to be important on the exam? Yeah. You got 75 minutes, how many questions? 40. That's less than two minutes per question. Does that make sense? Oh, by the way, let's talk about a strategy for the exam. Um, they're, they're, First of all, you're going to get drawn from a random, I've got 40 random pools. And so the chances of any two of you getting the same exam are 1 in 256 million. So don't worry about someone else doing it earlier and passing the stuff to their friends. Don't worry about that. Now, the second thing I'm going to tell you is that they appear in random order. So those pools appear in random order of the exam. And I always feel bad for students who get randomly drawn the worst problem for number one, right? Because what are they, what, what is our, our, our human minds tend to want to work straight through things. Does that make sense? You can't because you might get stuck on that first one, spend 30 minutes on it, and you're like, woohoo, I got it. And then you realize you don't have time to work on the rest of it. So here's my advice to you. Uh, by the way, I do let you go backward and forward. I do let you do that, so don't freak out. So uh, you look at number one, and you're like, skip, <laughs> right? And you're number two, you're like, yeah, I got that. And you, you answer it, and you, you get to number three, and it's, it's a little hard, so you're like, I'll come back to that. So go through, nail down all your easy ones, and here's why. Every single question on the exam has the exact same point value. And here's how I set it up an exam. When I build an exam, you think I'm just like randomly pulling crap out of the universe. I'm not. I'm trying to have a certain number of questions that only A students will get right. And then I have a certain number of questions that only A and B students will get right. And then I have a certain number of questions that only A, B, and C students will get right. And then, you know, I've got to throw these poor folks a bone down here on the bottom. I, I'm going to have stuff that everybody can get right. Um, I very seldom have people do less than 25%, which is like if they were just randomly guessing, right? So I always throw out some things that, that people know. So what does this mean for you? You want to go through and get all those DNF problems? Just nail down. And they're going to take you like three seconds apiece. And then you're going to go back, knock out the C's, the B's, and then when you've got time left over, you go back and knock out those A's. And by the way, this has a psychological impact too. Uh, if you go out and you win, what does that do to your confidence level? Yeah, it increases it. What does that do to your nervousness? Reduces it. Does that make sense? And so this, this is going to help you uh, mathematically, psychologically, uh, emotionally. I think it's, a, it's the best way to go about it. And it's amazing how many people, once I tell them this and they do it, they can improve their grade dramatically because we're so used to thinking, boom, 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 I've got to do these in a row. And we're absolutely wrong to think that way. Unless your professor's forcing you to do that, which is cruel. Questions? Okay. Yeah? Are the practice questions going to be like a replica of the exam questions or no? Oh, there are no replicas in this world. When you go out there in the real world, do you think? Well, not this. To... Well, of course the numbers would be different and the wordings, but. Yes, the numbers and wording will be different. But will the practice like still be If you them? can do the practice and the homework with no problem quickly, you'll be fine. Okay. 
Okay. Now, uh, no, and here's why. Because I have, uh, so, uh, and especially for people who don't have English as their first language, because those people, uh, they, they can focus on that quantitative step, right? And then they get on to the conceptual question, they get blown away. English is your first language. Yeah. It, it's closer to being very good for you. There are no guarantees in this life, right? I could walk out of here today after class and get hit by a bus. I believe we've discussed the bus scenario before, right? No guarantees in life. Okay, now, one more thing I want to talk to you about, and that is amortization. Uh, when we amort have an amortized loan, every payment is a combination of two things. What are they? Principal and interest. And uh, I actually go through and we build out an amortization table. And if you've gone through that, you know what a tremendous pain in the butt that is. Um, and what I might ask is, how much interest is paid in the second year? And you would only have to work your way down to that, right? The other thing that I might ask, in fact, this is one of my very favorite questions of all time. Are you ready? I'm going to give you a 30-year mortgage with a present value and an interest rate. And I'm going to tell you monthly payments. Of course, mortgages are always monthly. And I'm going to ask you how much interest is paid over the life of the mortgage. And you're going to look at that and you're going to call me something really foul. And you're going to say, I'm going to have to do this for 360 months? The answer is no. Remember that each payment represents principal and interest. If I know the monthly payment, all I have to do is multiply it by 360, and that tells me the total amount of money paid. Does that make sense? I take the monthly payment, multiply it by 360. That gives me the total amount of, monthly, of money paid. Now, that total amount represents both principal and interest. Now, do I know the amount of principal? Do I know how much I borrowed? Yes. Absolutely. So how can I find out the amount of interest? Nice. Yeah, all I have to do is take that 360 times the monthly payment and subtract out the principal, and that tells me the total amount of interest paid. It takes like a minute and 15 seconds to solve. If you do it by creating a 360-month amortization table and adding up all the interest, you're not going to finish it this semester, right? So there you go. There's some more easy points.